I went to prison for the first time when I was 18. I remember the journey there as if it were yesterday. I sat in the back of the prison vehicle and looked out. We reached the edge of the city and our journey continued. I wondered what would prison be like. My knowledge of prison came from the media. Would I see prison staff beating the inmates? Would there be gangs? What violence would be taking place? What diseases were there? We traveled onwards. Eventually, we reached the prison gate. I saw the prison staff dressed as soldiers. I saw guards and guns and bars. We passed through the gate, and we entered a community within a community. I saw dozens of homes for prison staff, a parade ground, a primary school, a prison on my right, and we continued upwards. By this time, the paved road had finished. We jolted and jumped through potholes and crevices until eventually on the top of the hill, I saw the prison looming like a castle. We approached the vast gate and entered through a tiny door cut into it, being forced to stoop and be humbled as I entered prison for the first time. I stopped, searching took place. I looked out on the prison courtyard and saw hundreds of men milling around, killing time. But I wasn't to join them. A warder came, we passed through a padlock gate and walked around the prison fence. There were spotlights, guard towers, guns. Eventually we came to a building, knocked quietly on the door and it was opened. We moved from light into darkness. And there I found myself in condemned section death row. I knew that I was to meet those sentenced to death for crimes like treason and cowardice and mutiny. I wasn't there as a prisoner but as a visitor and I found myself embraced, warmly welcomed by the prisoners and the prison staff. My journey to prison had started about three months before. I'd spent that time in a government hospital bathing and feeding and advocating for patients dying of AIDS with tuberculosis who'd been abandoned by their families. It was there that I met prisoners, often handcuffed to their beds, sometimes soiling themselves, usually young men like me in prison for having underage sex. I got to know them by name. I saw that their hopes, their fears, their dreams, they weren't different from mine. After leaving death row, I went to the prison hospital I noticed that the windows were broken, the paint was peeling from the walls, the smell wasn't good. As I entered, a teenage boy died, and a blanket was bought to sew his body up in before he would go to the grave. I spent the coming three months working with prisoners and prison staff to refurbish that prison hospital, believing that even if prisoners were to die there, they died when they felt their lives were valued. They died with dignity. Several years later, I came to establish the African Prisons Project to bring dignity and hope to men and women and children in prison. Believing that prisons could be places of positive transformation and that people in prison could serve their communities and their nations. I spent all of my adult life working in prisons. I spent time in 120 or 130 of them all over Africa and all over the world. I've seen some common challenges, the issue of overcrowding, the challenge of having access to lawyers, how to provide good quality health care to this vulnerable population, how to educate, how to rehabilitate, how to break the cycle of crime. In prison, I felt joy. I've seen great hope. I've seen sorrow. I've shed tears. I've had the privilege to have conversations with those that are hidden away from the rest of society. I've got so many stories to tell and yet so little time. I want to share with you a few examples of people and places that have touched and shaped me. The first is Robert. He was one of the first prisoners I met. I could tell he was a prisoner by the distinctive uniform that made him stand out in the government hospital. I approached him, he was soiled and smelt. He said he'd been in prison for six months on remand for stealing vegetables. He had AIDS and cancer. Working with colleagues, we washed him, fed him, paid for him to have chemotherapy, 
track down his mother to come and attend to him. It became clear that he was going to die, and his wish was that he died not wearing the prison uniform, but at home, in the hands of his family. So we went to court on his behalf. We understood that it was felt he'd been too sick to go to court himself, which is why he was on remand indefinitely. We presented his case to the magistrate. He said, this boy has already served enough time. He released him. We hired a pickup, drove him home, and he died in the arms of his family the next day. I was impressed that the magistrate, on the first opportunity he had, showed compassion. Several years ago, I visited a death row inmate in America. As I approached his cell, I saw that there was a solid door made out of metal. It was opened, and another door made out of bars. The cell had no window. The man spent 23 out of every 24 hours there. For one hour a day, he was allowed to walk up and down inside a corridor. I contrasted that with my experience of being on death row in Uganda. For sure, the inmates complained that they didn't have beds, that the food wasn't the best. But I saw that they were playing volleyball, attending church services, studying, that every spare scrap of dirt was being used to grow fruit and vegetables. I saw prisoners and prison staff interacting as fellow human beings. I realize it's not a question of how much money we pour into our prisons, but it's a question of what aspiration we have, what belief we have about the change that can take place there. Several years ago, I visited Naivasha Maximum Prison with 3,500 inmates. Almost half of them are involved in formal education being taught by their peers. Their classroom resembles a warehouse. And yet, this prison has become an academic institution, almost a university. Lives are being transformed. Men are leaving saying, I'm different now from when I went in. As I traveled to prisons around the world, I saw that often prisons were designed and prison regimes were designed to make one inward looking, to focus on oneself. What will I eat? Where will I sleep? What must I wear? How must my hair be? What will happen if I break the rules? It seemed to me often the happiest prisons with the least tension, which were most effective at rehabilitating, were ones where there was a sense of community. Once there was a sense of us being a group of people who are living together, trying to support each other. These lessons influenced the way that we worked as the African Prisons Project. Initially, we started out establishing libraries and clinics, believing that having a nice place to read or be treated would bring dignity and hope. We soon saw that by itself, a library changed nothing. If a prisoner was reading a book and the officer went in and said, you idiot, what are you bothering with books for? You think books can change your life? There would be no impact. We realized you can't bring change in the lives of prisoners without thinking about prison staff and their families. If you say that education is valuable for prisoners, it must be valuable for all members of the prison community. So we started... So we started employing librarians and teachers and lawyers and counselors to meet the basic health and education and legal needs of prisoners and prison staff and their families. Demand for our work grew, but we knew this model was unsustainable. We would never be able to afford to employ all the people we needed to to bring the change in prison. But we realized we didn't need to because prisoners were filled with gifted and talented and able prisoners and prison staff. These men and women were already serving their community. They might volunteer and say, let me teach. Let me preach. Let me see how I can mentor and coach those around me. There were these men and women who knew prison inside out, far greater than anyone else from the outside could, who had the answers to the problem. It seemed to us that the way we could have impact as an organization was identifying these change makers in the prison community and giving them more resources, access to training, access to a network, and a platform so they could share the lessons they were learning and influence change from the bottom up. One of the programs we have is an opportunity to study for a degree in law with the University of London by correspondence. We now have around 50 undergraduate students in prisons in Uganda and Kenya. Our idea was that our students would gain legal knowledge to represent themselves and their peers. 
Our idea was that those who had first-hand experience of conflict with the law were best placed to use the law to protect the poor. We've seen that most of our brightest students are those on death row. They've been told by a judge, go and suffer death. You're only fit for the grave, and yet they're excelling in their studies. We've seen three death sentences overturned. One of our former death row inmates, a chap called Paddy, who was there for 10 years, is running for parliament next year. Who can imagine that when he gets there, he can say, it is prison who equipped me for this role. Another of our programs provides the opportunity for prison staff to be trained to provide legal services in rural prisons where it's almost impossible to access a lawyer. One of those we trained is a chap called Paul. He'd wanted to become a lawyer, but didn't have any money to continue his education, so left school at the age of 16. He joined the prison service. I first met him about a year ago. I went to his prison where all of the prisoners and prison staff were assembled. The African Prisons Project had trained Paul and two other officers at his prison to provide basic legal services to prisoners who had no representation. Paul said, in the first three months of this year, we have got 20% of the prisoners in this prison released. He spoke with pride and joy as he spoke about the men he had gotten out of that prison and the fact they were back home with their families, contributing to their communities. I saw that some of the other prison staff laughed at him because he was so enthusiastic and passionate about bringing change and bringing justice in the lives of prisoners. But he didn't care. As I visited prisons around the world and seeing that as a world we're imprisoning more people, spending hundreds of billions of dollars each year on imprisonment, sending more people to be imprisoned in solitary confinement. I thought, what lessons can Africa teach the world about prisons? So often the, the discourse around Africa is the dark continent. We hear about wars and terrorists and famine, but in prison I've seen hope. In prison I've seen creativity. I've seen that out of the most minimal building blocks, beautiful creations are coming up. Some of the lessons I've learned whilst working in prisons in Africa is that it's still possible for remarkable leaders to come from unlikely places. I think about the people who inspired me most, about Martin Luther King, Gandhi, Mandela. These people were labeled terrorists, rebels. I think about Jesus, John the Baptist, Paul, these were people who were named as destabilizing influences in their society. Yet all of these people spent time in prison or were executed. It doesn't matter how you've been labeled. It doesn't matter what others have said about you. Each of us has an opportunity to be great because each of us can serve. I've also realized that some of the most amazing innovation comes from the bottom up. I saw that when our lives are comfortable, when we have enough material possessions, when we're healthy, when we're in positions of power, there's a risk that our hearts become cold to the needs of others around us. But I saw that when our possessions are stripped from us, when we fail, when we're rejected, as can sometimes happen to those in prison, there's an opportunity for, to build understanding with those in needs to build relationships and compassion for those who are suffering from that first-hand experience. I realize that those who are making the policies are often too far removed from those who are uh, being forced to experience their policies. We need to listen to those on the ground who might not have the best educations, who might have been labeled as prisoners or disabled or refugees. But often their suffering, the difficulties they've experienced, have given them a unique perspective and unique solutions to global problems. I've also realized that there's tremendous potential in each and every one of us, just where we are today. Each of us has our own set of gifts and talents and skills. No one can take them away from us. If it's possible for a death row inmate who's in a cell that doesn't have light, who has to study by torchlight, who has no table or chair to get a qualification in law, if it's possible for the lowest ranking prison staff to go to court and speak to magistrates and judges and get dozens of prisoners released, 
if it's possible for the sick prisoner to look after and feed the even sicker neighbor? What possibility is there for each of us? Society only reaches its fullest potential when each person has the opportunity to fully use their gifts and talents. Since the age of 21, I've been a magistrate. I've sent many people to prison, and yet I've been nicknamed a prisoner by choice. And I wouldn't have it any other way. I'm proud and amazed of what can happen in prisons, the way that lives can be transformed. People say, why does what happened in prison affect the rest of us? Why should we be interested in what's going on behind those walls and bars? We should be interested because the people in prison are our brothers and sisters. They're our mothers and fathers, our sons and daughters. We should be interested because globally we're spending so much money on our prisons and yet we're not seeing enough transformation. They say that you can judge a community by the way it treats its prisoners. How do we, as the world in 2015, want to be judged? It's been said that we're all potential prisoners, and it's true. But we also all have the potential to have our lives transformed by those who've lived and worked in prisons. Thank you.